Hey there, and welcome back to the Brandon Sneed Show, a podcast telling stories about people making their way through life in all levels of sports, art, and entertainment, from world-famous all-time greats to local legends and everyone in between. We cover where people are now, how they got there, moments along the way they weren't sure they'd make it, and the things that have pulled them through. I'm your host, Brandon Sneed. You can find links to and updates about all of this at my website, brandonsneed.com, and show notes, bonus material, and more by subscribing to my newsletter there. Today, we have episode eight with guest Natanya Ross, an actress who became a child star in the 90s playing Robin Russo on Nickelodeon's The Secret World of Alex Mack. Things eventually took a turn for her. She began struggling with a drug addiction that left her nearly homeless and her career in shambles. But after a long road, she's pulled herself out of that hole. She is entering her 40s now clean, sober, and doing really cool things and good work to help other people who were struggling like she used to be. I met her earlier this year while working on a magazine story about a good friend of hers who is actually next week's guest. And I love her story and I think you will too. So as always, thank you for being here and for listening. And here is Natanya. All right. Well, hello, Natanya. How are you? Hello. <laughs> How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Thanks for for being here, for doing this. Why don't you introduce yourself to people real quick? Okay. Uh, I am Natanya Ross. Uh, You know, uh, I mean, they're, man, what would I even say? Uh, You probably know me from the 90s. I was a, had made a good little uh, chunk of myself in the fabric of 90s pop culture. And yeah, just getting back into some of it now recently. So obviously um, there's a lot to me and a lot, my life has been really crazy and I'm sure we'll go into some of that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah well, I'm having you here. One, because you know you were, I mean, you're child actor, child star, went down that whole road, most well-known for uh, Secret World of Alex Mack. And yes. we'll talk about that a lot. You were also, I mean, did a bunch of guest spots too. I mean, and some of like, I think everybody's like childhood favorites. You got some Boy Meets World on the resume. You got some ER. I don't know if that's a childhood favorite, but you were in it. Um, you got the Freaky Friday show, Babysitter's Club. I mean, you were, you know, all over the place there for a, for most of your, you know. I was. Upbringing in there. So yeah, you've been yeah. in the thick of it. Um, and yeah. then, I mean, from there, you know, you kind of, I got to know you a little bit working on my story about Sean, who he actually agreed to record one of these podcasts as well. So I'm excited about that. Yeah. But we talked a lot. um, I mean, it didn't end up, you know, in that story about just kind of you, your life, what you've been through, suffered through, overcome and what you're doing with it now, which is, I mean, you know, you went through kind of the, the drug addiction pattern right I mean you got into it young let it you know it kind of did its thing with you as far as uh just kind of taking over your life and I mean you ended up pretty much homeless at one point right yeah I I, yeah I ended up living in a car for like a year and a half Mm -hmm. and um you know never like quite on the streets but uh pretty close enough close enough close enough Yeah. yeah Close enough. Um, and probably just like seconds and inches away from that, you know, and I just, for whatever reason, God kind of granted me the opportunity of, um, you know, a second, third, fourth chance, whatever you want to call it. And yeah, so here I am still standing. Thank God. (laughs) Yeah. And so what are you doing now? Um, so I work in treatment now. I'm a director of a rehab in, uh, Los Angeles area. And yeah, I help other um, addicts and alcoholics that are struggling get into a qualified treatment program. And um, yeah, I do that. I work a lot in the homeless communities. I started a nonprofit uh, about 10 years ago called San Fernando Valley Feed the Homeless. 
And then throughout COVID, I linked up with an organization called Hope of the Valley and have tried to be helpful to them in whatever areas I can, mainly just, you know, um, I'm, I'm able to use my platform a little bit to help spread awareness about who they are and what they're doing. And yeah, kind of got back into the Hollywood acting scene uh, like five years ago. Um, so I am flying around the country now doing meet and greets and personal appearances and, you know, the whole uh, kind of autograph signing show circuit, um, which has been cool. And I get to do it with a lot of my friends, which is really special. And yeah, I've been writing a book for the last couple of years. The expected release date will be 2023. And yeah, that's me. Awesome. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, well, your stories, I mean, great. I was going to kind of jump in like early days, how you got into child acting. Then I just kind of wanted to try to trace it just from there to where you are now, because I mean, it has been a lot. So, yeah. I mean, how, how do you in particular get into, you know, acting at, cause you were young when you started acting, how old were you? Yeah, I was six months old actually. So. <laughs> oh, wow. I didn't realize it was that young. Yeah. That is yeah. the actual so was, baby. Like, Mm -hmm. I was doing like the Gerber baby stuff and then just commercial after commercial after commercial until I was, you know, by the time I was speaking, I had been in it, you know, my whole life at that point. And, and um, then it started to get, you know, busier and busier. And I started booking films where there were speaking roles and this was all still back in New Jersey. And then um, and then I kind of got my big break with a TV show called Billy which was, um, you know, my first network sitcom on ABC and the TGIF lineup. So that moved us out to California um, at like okay. eight years old. Yeah, eight and a How half. Old, where were you living before you moved out there? Um, before that, I was in Manhattan. So I was doing okay. a lot of off-Broadway, Annie, all of that kind of stuff. Um, I was going to professional children's school, otherwise known as PCS for all the right. alumni of that school. And um and yeah, and then, like I said, I got the opportunity uh, to do Billy and that mm. moved us out here. And um, it just, it, it it got very successful very quickly right after that. And we just never went back. And no. The rest and of were, your, were your parents in the industry? Like, how did you, I mean, at six years old, become, you know, essentially a Gerber baby? And then- Yeah, what, no, they were how not. How did you get into it? How did they, that happen? Um, it was all my mom, really. You know, she saw, she, I, I think she just like continued to get, um, like a, a lot of comments about how cute the baby was and this and that, and she should be in modeling or acting or whatever. And uh, my mom just hustled and made it happen. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. What, what did your What did your parents do? What did your mom do? Um. So my mom was. Um. I mean, honestly, she was just kind of a stay at home mom and wife. Mm -hmm. Um. My father actually was a. a I always have to be like careful the way I say this. We're from Asbury Park, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. So I, if you've ever watched The Sopranos, that's where it's based oh, out. Of. I see. Okay. Um, so you know, we had all the money in the world. Um, mm -hmm. My mom had all the resources she needed to take this little child and make the child into something. Right. Um, so yeah, that that was it. And then when we moved out to California, my father had actually gotten in a lot of trouble back in. Uh, the state of New York and was sentenced to probation in the state of New York was not allowed to leave the state somehow not sure how all that happened but he got his um, probation commuted to Los Angeles so then a year later my father moved out to Los Angeles with us and stayed for about three four years and then left actually and I was 14 when he left and I actually never saw him again um mm -hmm to this day and he's pat he passed like 15 years ago um mm. and then he he transitioned into a woman when oh, i was wow. about 15 years old okay. yeah so yeah. um yeah i have a it's a very interesting um complicated layered <laughs> story yeah that. that's a lot i mean it's a be, lot yeah how yeah. like um <laughs> we won't dig into it but how aware of the asbury park ness of it all were you I mean, yeah. because you're pretty young i'd imagine you're probably was shielded yeah i was shielded from a lot of it i think yeah. i mean in hindsight looking back i can definitely like recognize 
you know, how many uncles I had that came over to the house all the sure. time. And there's probably uncles, see a lot more in hindsight, and uncle right? Bobby and uncle Richie and uncle. Yeah. I mean, there was just no. that whole thing. And, um, you know, my father was king of that town. And, mm. uh, so looking back, I could definitely recognize all of it. We would walk down the streets and people would like fall at his feet. And I didn't oh. really understand it. He owned one of the biggest electrical supply companies, um, in that area, which, you know, later we found out was kind of like a front for right. a lot of illegal activity, which is what he was in trouble for by the time we moved to California. And by that time he lost everything. He lost all his money and, you know, mm. and, and I think the idea was to make me as famous as possible. And, and that's what she did. I mean, to be honest, yeah. that's what my mom accomplished that. And I obviously was the driving force of it. So by the time we came to California, especially by the time he left, I was very well known, very successful on the number yeah. one kid show in the world. And uh, I became the sole breadwinner of the family. Oh, wow. Yeah. And, and yeah. It, it really had been like that, to be honest, since I was about 10 years old. Um, yeah. So yeah, there was a lot, there was a lot going on in all different aspects. <laughs> yeah. Wow. And I mean, what's going on for you just internally, emotionally is, I mean, this is all kind of unfolding because I mean, there are a lot of threads to tug at here, but really the core interest of mine in this conversation, at least is, I mean, you and like your experience with it and how you oh because I mean even just hearing that like no wonder you know you were you're carrying a lot of shit there yeah there's that a you lot. probably weren't even fully aware of at that young age you just so what were you I mean feeling yeah. I mean I think from a like a very young age I always knew that like there was something very different about my family um you know I mean aside from all of the all of that stuff like my mom and dad just didn't get along they mm. fought a lot it was very um very tense environment yeah. very um you know I mean they did the best they could I suppose but so yeah I don't know I think from a really early age I just developed a, a fine-tuned skill of compartmentalizing how I felt and um you know by the time I was like a, a regularly working actor um I was able to escape so often into like different characters that had yeah. nothing to do with Natanya Ross that I, I think I, I didn't even necessarily need to develop like coping skills per se. Right. I had like a double life, you know, I would have yeah. during the day when I went to set with my work family and I was all these different characters and specifically Robin on Alex Mack at like, you know, I, I get so many beautiful, amazing people telling me like that girl saved my life when I was yeah. growing up. It was the first representation of like, a, a goth or an emo girl or an right. alternative girl on Nickelodeon at that time. And she was just really like tapped into the darker pockets of life and, and uh, like understood pessimism and, and cynicism and uh, depression and was vocal about it, um, you know, on the show. And it saved me from, you know, feeling like an outcast or wanting to commit suicide and all of this stuff. Yeah. And the backstory, which is like just as interesting is that, that character did the same for me as well. Even though yeah. I was the entity playing the character, it gave me an opportunity every day to have somewhere safe to go yeah. and express myself artistically and creatively um, and not really have to think too much about what was going on at home, you yeah. know? And I've always, I've always been the kind of person I keep a lot like very close to the chest or to the vest, however they say that anyway. <laughs> I'm not like the type that's going to just go around and be like, Hey, this is what's going on at home. But you know, the truth is this stuff was getting darker and darker and there was a lot of alcoholism in the home. And you know, the first person I ever had buy me alcohol was my dad when I was like 12 years old. So I was just exposed to a lot of stuff at a certain point, they had an open marriage. So, you know, there's like a lot of different people coming in and out and, and like, I knew it was wow. weird and, and it felt very wrong. Um, and it was something I definitely like wanted to shield from when my friends would come over and stuff. But on the other side of the coin, it gave me every opportunity in the world to do whatever the fuck I wanted. Cause not, no. there wasn't a lot of like, at least at home in those circumstances, there wasn't a lot of attention being paid to me in the sense that like, I could come home from set 
and just go in my room and do whatever I want. And they didn't really bother me, you yeah. know, so I wanted to smoke cigarettes or I wanted to smoke weed or drink alcohol yeah. or boys stay over or my girlfriends come over and hang out. Like none of it mattered. And it's interesting too, even the cast of Alex Mack, we we've talked about this often that like everyone wanted to come over to my house because there was no rules and we could just <laughs> do whatever we wanted, you know? So there yeah. were so many like elements and layers to it. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, definitely by like the time I was 13 or 14 drinking and smoking, weed became like a very natural coping mechanism for me yeah. where I was already kind of like baseline sober the life of the party but like with a little bit of alcohol I was definitely like this the main center of attention and I think I liked that because I was lacking that at right. home but yeah. as a teenager when you get so much attention you can't really differentiate between what's good attention and bad attention yeah right? so you like act out in certain behaviors that um that now as a grown adult I know we're like completely inappropriate for a 13 14 year old child to be doing but it, it's you know it's it's I keep saying complicated and layered because that's what it is and as like yeah. a famous kid in Hollywood in the 90s where there was no pressure of social media or TMZ or anything like that we really just like went nuts you know yeah. and there was not a lot of parental structure around from anybody's parents or anyone's camps really to um, be telling us what to do. And I was in such an intricate position because by this time I really was the only person making money for the family. Uh -huh. and it was really, it just was very hard to, to re rein me in, you know? Yeah, man. I mean, that's just a uh, child and not bring up like just pure emotional chaos, really. I mean, yeah. But pure... also like, yeah, pure emotional chaos. Um, but also, um, but like a beautiful chaos too. Yeah. You know, like a childhood I would not trade for anything else in the world. Um, but yeah, I mean, definitely, yes, definitely a chaotic, yeah. a chaotic childhood for sure. Yeah, I mean, it just sounds on one hand, yeah. I mean, in, in a way, it's almost every kid's dream. I can do whatever I want. That's what we all think we want as kids. But that's what you have. Oh, and you have that. Look, I and now it's like. Friends. I look at my other actor friends that I was on shows with or whatever that had like a very decent grounded parental structure that maybe like mm -hmm. fucked around a little bit experimentation a little bit yeah but like they're all very successful actors directors writers now yeah. so in hindsight it's like you know if i that, if i had had something different there would i would my that's where i was going yeah that's where i was going with it is i mean yeah. it's funny like you think that's what you want as a kid but i mean it, it does even just the way you're talking about it at least to me it just sounds like i mean there's that party that still craves that structure that discipline that you know, tell me what to do or what not to do. You know, it's like, even though you yeah. want to do whatever you want to do, there's that part of you that knows I need my parents to tell me what's good for me and what's bad for me. And totally. Yeah. yeah. I just didn't, I, in my life, I didn't get dealt the hand of cards with the kind of parents that were going to be able to do that. Yeah. That yeah. just wasn't my story. So in adulthood, I've had to really learn how to self-correct and self-structure and, and all of the stuff that, um, I was, you know, lacking as a kid and, and I feel like I've done a pretty good job of it for sure, but mm -hmm. you know, um, nobody's perfect obviously. And, um, you know, as an adult, um, I mean, there's so much to this, there's so much to the story and I know we're like hopping around and skipping around and, no, you're good. you know, but I actually at 35 years old, um, or 34, actually, I found out I was adopted. Whoa. And yeah. So like Whoa. this whole lifetime that I've had of like being famous and rich and then losing everything and then being like a gnarly fucking drug addict for 10 years. And then at 30, finally, like getting a, a long-term recovery yeah. um, and a structure and a life. And, you know, uh, I, I say built an empire for myself. I mean, I live in a two bedroom apartment with, you know, I, I still live paycheck yeah. to paycheck too. But for me, like, I finally figured out the secret of life that it's like, not always obsessing about everything that you want, but being grateful for all that you have. Yeah. And to me, that's having built an empire for sure. And then, you know, you're 34 years old and you have lived this life with, you know, um, these, these specific type of parents that yeah. 
well, it'll fuck you up as an adult, no matter what, like, I don't care how strong somebody is, yeah. you know, I think my, all my money was stolen. I mean, it just, it goes on and on and on. I, I didn't, I, I barely got maybe like a hundred thousand dollars from like everything that I've ever had. So the rest of it was just, well, I don't know where it is. I don't know. I mean, it was, a, it, it's a, it was such a mind fuck. And then yeah, at 34, I found out um, I was adopted and that I actually have a brother and a sister and um, four uncles and four cousins and a grandpa and all of these people that I had longed for so much my whole life no without even knowing that I, that's what I was longing for. Yeah. yeah. And um, so. So I imagine you're probably feeling, I mean, where, where all of, where are all of them now? Have you uh, connected with them? Oh yeah. I mean, my sister yeah. is my maid of honor in my wedding, which is in two months. Mm. Um, my brother's in the groomsmen side. My uncle's walking me down the aisle. Oh, that's amazing. Um, my other two uncles are splitting the father daughter dance. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I got very lucky. I've heard a lot of stories of people, you know, that either found out they were adopted or knew they were adopted, met their birth family and hated them or, it just, it wasn't yeah. like a good fit. It didn't, whatever. And we've all picked up, like we never were apart. Where, is, where were they? How did you end up getting separated from them in the beginning? And how did you find them? Yeah. Um, my birth mother had three children that she gave up for adoption. And it was kind mm. of like a backdoor, very sealed, closed, private adoption. Um, and my mother just passed it off as if, she had had me herself. Um, uh, yeah. I mean, literally stories throughout my lifetime of like, well, what, when I was pregnant with you and, and I think that's, so she's even telling you stories about when she was pregnant with you that never happened. She changed my birthday. She told me, so on my birth certificate, it, my birthday is October 4th, but she told me my whole life, my birthday was October 8th and they just messed up on the birth certificate. And as a little kid, you don't not trust your parents. You don't yeah. you just believe anything they say. So Jesus. I never even looked into it really. Um, and then one day, very randomly, a work colleague of mine from the treatment industry called me and said, hey, I really need to talk to you. Um, and basically long story short, he said, somebody I went to high school with thinks that they're your brother. I was like, what? That's so, it was just so wild. And, you know, long story short, I hopped on the phone with this brother and he told me the whole story and said that our birth mother had found me through watching a movie called, that I did called Shadow Zone Undead Express, which was with mm. Chance Leah Party. And, um, and just saw me on screen and knew I was her daughter and hired a private investigator. And, wow. and that was it. And, um, and unfortunately, both birth parents passed before I could have ever met them. But, you know, um, so and, th and that really goes to show a lot too. like, I really was not supposed to have any other parents, but th my mom and dad, mm -hmm. um, that was just my lot in life. But like, I guess by the time I was a fully recovered, like, actualized self realized person at 34, 35 years old, God was like, Okay, it's time now you get to embrace something that you've never had your whole life so that's wow. how it all unfolded very fucking crazy um super wild it was you know the first time i really really realized how mentally ill my mother was um and i was never mad i just was kind of sad for her yeah you know i was sad for her and, and have thought every single day since i found out how hard that must have been for her to have kept that her whole life and every single day be worried that yeah. like her little daughter was going to find out that she yeah. actually. Yeah. I mean, you gotta, you gotta think about what must be happening inside of a person to, to do that, you know, that, like as pain, is, painful as it is for you, like what are heavy. they carrying? It's too heavy of a burden to carry every single day. So I've always had the utmost yeah. empathy. I really hold no resentment about the money or anything like that, because that's actually more poisonous to me to hold yeah. on to than it would be. Yeah, like that's such a, like I was talking with a friend earlier today about exactly that, you know, just whenever we have conflict or people disappoint us or hurt us, it's like there is kind of this one side of the coin where people like hold on to the rage. It's kind of like this trend almost, she was saying, yeah, you know, like hold on to the rage. It makes it, it makes it easier. Just be mad, you know, and it's like, nah, like I've, I've got people in my life that have hurt me 
terribly and like you have and it's and that's what you're saying is like it's so much healthier to just yeah and someone like me who's an alcoholic um you know and obviously very addictive tendencies i i can't afford to like hold on to that kind of exactly yeah it's too dangerous for me um and it's just not worth it life's very short and that kind of like a hate and an anger can really poison a soul so it's just not worth it yeah, I mean, it just becomes this like uh, self-creating cycle of like, I mean, you know, it it feels good almost to feel that bad. And then that becomes addictive. And then the things that you use to cope with that, I mean, those are the things that, will you know, that's kind of what happened with you. Um, and I'll, I'll get to that in a second, but I'm just, I had no idea about this yeah. whole adoption, you know, biological family. I mean, what, what did it do for you to actually where, where do they live? Are they in California? Where are they? No, they're all, they're spread all over. So Austin, okay. Texas, Atlanta, Olympia, okay. Washington. Um, they're all over. That's just amazing though. I mean, you, yeah. you found, you found a whole ass family like in your thirties that are actually your blood and like you had, and no they're idea. amazing. Yeah. And they're great. Yeah. Yep. Holy that's. And they're so it, much like me and yeah, it's really crazy. I mean, it just seems like I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, it just sounds like there was this part of you that felt like you were somehow alone and isolated all through everything, even as you're famous as hell, you know, and it's like, you find them and it seems like, oh, okay, like, here's my people, like, I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm not all by myself here. Yeah, yeah, that's, what did that do for you? That's incredible. I mean, it was, uh, you know, uh, I mean so much even sometimes when I tell the story I'm a little disassociated from it because it's just been such a, like a wild ride and a crazy yeah. life and like I said I learned how to really compartmentalize feelings but that's also like not um a suggested route to take in life all the time like yeah. um I've just obviously been very hardened by a lot of stuff but it there's definitely a piece that comes from knowing that like no matter what I have these people that are my blood and and I've never been able to say that my whole life you know like oh my my sister my blood like you know yeah. and just the bond between sisters is um I've experienced obviously in different ways with some of my best friends of course but like um just like looking at somebody and being like fuck this person like right. really looks like me and right. you know it's, it's just like a whole different vibe for well, sure they, they probably just feel like you I mean it probably like you were probably so confused like you're told yeah. your mom is your mom and you're like but I, and you can feel it when you're somebody's not really your person or your people and it's like yeah. am I like okay I'm her kid but it's just yeah. not no, it's not something you can like, articulate kind of until yeah. Yeah. You, you definitely kind of know a little bit so wow. yeah that is, that's intense yeah it'll all be in the book you know I don't want to give like too too much away no that's yeah, just incredible I mean yeah really lived your whole life both professionally and personally as like not really yourself until fairly yeah. recently yeah until like the last 10 years ago yeah yeah wow um that's amazing um yeah. and so but yeah I mean so the core like kind of the the story where you ended up though is you did I mean you went down the rabbit hole what was your what was your drug of choice that kind of took you there and how did you end up in that yeah so I started partying pretty like early on a lot of drinking and smoking weed and stuff and I didn't really start experimenting with harder drugs till I was about 17 18 and it started off with 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 what felt very much just like partying you know, ecstasy, cocaine at that time, every door in Hollywood was open to us. If you're like again rich and famous as a kid in the nineties, like so many, you know, so many inappropriate opportunities, just like (laughs) you're led into any club you want with bottle service in the back. I mean, it's just pretty crazy. And then even at like 16 years old, you just can roll up to a club and wherever you can go, wherever if you're somebody and and at that time, that's how it was. I'm sure it's much different now. And, um, yeah, that just turned into like more and more experimentation. And then I think I just fell into like the wrong crowd of people. Um, and there's always been a part of me that's like, whether I knew it at the time or not, I can recognize it now that I try and create family with any, within Mm. any group that I'm in and still to this day, I mean, I still 
do that if it's very hard to get close to me but once you're in you're in forever and mm-hmm. I consider you like family and um so yeah I just kind of had a rougher group of friends that were all fucking famous too super famous too so like yeah. it felt like it didn't feel like we were doing anything all that wrong and then you know typical story a boy comes in and I fall in love and um and he you know it just uh I, I got exposed to things that I'd never really seen before. And I don't put that on anybody else because I made all my own choices. And yeah. I, you know, for the most part, knew my consequences. But I was introduced to heroin at 18 years old. And yeah. it finally provided me that relief of like, like I could breathe for mm, the first time. Yeah. Like the thoughts in my head weren't as loud as they had normally been. And I think like kind of in that first moment of like floating into that feeling of what like that specific opioid is, it's like the King Cobra of all drugs is kind of how I um, describe it, you know, and and once it gets teeth in you, it's like very hard. And I wasn't explained like, you know, well, if you stay on this for like six months or even three months, you're going to have a physical addiction. It's not just like, a party drug. This is not a line of cocaine and a glass of champagne. This is heroin, you know, and, and, um, and pretty quickly in, I started, um, using it intravenously and, um, and that's kind of when it was over for me, you know, once I started experimenting with needles and then it, it makes allowance of like doing other drugs with needles and it was just a wrap for me very quickly and I think you know we held on to that lifestyle for about a year the guy I was with was also a pretty successful actor and um so we had a little bit of money mainly his and um you know so for for a year I didn't even really have to experience the lack of having the drug it wasn't like I did heroin and then all of a sudden I'm like where am I going to get money for more like it was there it was always there um and uh and I held on to like any semblance of a, a life that I could. I was still trying to show up to auditions, trying to go out with my other friends. And, and it just got to a point where like, I just couldn't hold it together anymore. And I knew that yeah. there was a choice of like, get help and like, get better and get your life back or just fucking go in this lifestyle. Yeah. Form, you know, and in the yeah. 90s, we weren't really talking about mental health. We weren't talking about drug addiction and treatment and all of these kinds of things that obviously my entire life is about now. Um, So I just made the decision to just fuck it. I'm going for it. And I did. And we ran that lifestyle for as long as we possibly could until um, there was nothing left to run. And, you know, so we started out in this really nice apartment in the Hollywood Hills and doing our thing. And within a couple of years, we were you know, living in somebody's closet in Echo Park. And Mm. that was like right around the first time I attempted to go to rehab and get my life together. And then I got out and fell in love with another boy, you know, Mm. and this time I thought it would be different because he had been my best friend since we were 13, another very famous child actor. And, um, you know, we just within three months got kicked out of that apartment called the other boyfriend that I had yeah. been with. And somehow the three of us ended up living in a car together for the next year and a half. Oh, wow! Just like, you know, doing whatever little side hustles we could to get our drugs, like dependent on residual checks that we were having sent to a PO box, um, showering once a week at the park for $2 yeah. at that time, just surviving the best that we could. And then eventually we ended up moving to downtown LA to third and Alameda, which was like, Right mm-hmm. behind it was like a mini skid row where all mm-hmm. these tents were set up. And we went to a place called the American Hotel, which was like, it was, I think at that time it was like, it's super gentrified now. It's like really nice now, but it was like a yeah. trap hotel back in the day. And it was just yeah. a bunch of different transients living in different rooms. There was no bathroom, no kitchen, no nothing, one bathroom per floor. Um, and it was just like a big room that we paid $500 a month for. I don't even know how the fuck we scraped that together every month, but we somehow managed to, and we just kind of like ran game in downtown LA, like three ex famous child actors that like had no business being down there. Yeah. And all, and, and all we had was each other, you know? And um, so we, we did that for a while and then, and then, yeah. And then I, I got out of it and I, 
you know, started going to rehabs and sober livings and stuff like that. And I would put some time together and then I would relapse and then I'd put some more time together and I would relapse. And then I had something very traumatic happen when I was about 25 years old. And that was kind of it for me. And I decided at that Mm -hmm. time to, um, to really make like a, a, a good attempt at getting sober. And I did for about four years. And then I had one more relapse Um, And I went back to heroin for a year and then I turned 30 and I said, fuck this, like I'm going to die. I knew I was going to die. I knew I was going to die. So I went to a rehab called Beit Shuva. It's in Los Angeles. It's a Jewish rehab. You don't have to be Jewish to go there. Um, Somebody that uh, it was like an angel in my life basically came in and packed up all my shit, put it in storage. Got that's what I was about to ask is like, I mean, as you're kind of, I mean, I just have so many questions and threads yeah. there are to pull up, but since you have like an hour, we got like 20 minutes left. I'm going to try yeah. to be efficient with it, but yeah. it's, um, I mean, holy hell. I mean, how, I mean, as this is beginning and you're moving into a car with one boyfriend and an ex-boyfriend and all that, I mean, surely there's people in your life who know you. I mean, is anybody trying to help you or no, you, any, point- any of y'all like what? Yeah, at this point, everyone had pretty much given up, but it wasn't like, I mean, listen, if like me and my, the boyfriend that I was with at the time, um, not the ex-boyfriend, we had the same manager, like, yeah, I'm sure at, at many different points, we could have looked at each other and been like, let's call Beverly, let's yeah. call somebody, let's call our mom, let's call, you know, and like, uh, you know, at this point, like my mom was just kind of like, as soon as I wasn't acting anymore, there was like a very little um effort made Mm. to step in and help she put me in rehab the first time but kind of like wanted to whatever that's like a whole other story so i mean there were people sure but like they didn't try enough and we didn't ask enough basically i mean it it is it is it's one of those things where it it is this disease it takes hold and takes over yeah, and, it, and, it really and fall, at the same time yeah and it doesn't the same, fall on any specific person other than yeah, us like we were yeah. the caveat of like the choices we made yeah and there were multiple different times we could have made a right instead of making a left yeah. but also god i believe i'm i'm not like a super religious person but i'm very spiritual and i know that mm. God or whatever you want to call it, a power greater than yourself always has like, there's a specific plan for every human being on this planet. That's like written long before and long after we're gone. So for whatever reason, that was the experience we were all meant to have. Yeah. And I mean, there, where I was going with that too, is like, I mean, it really is something in you that it has to be what you want. Even if you think you want yeah. these other things, if you know, you have to really, and that's kind of what you alluded to as well. Is, I mean, certain things happen and you start to see things in a different way that make you actually want yeah. to change. It's not just, oh, it'd be nice to change. Oh, I know this isn't great for me. It's like, but you can still kind of ride that out. It's like certain things have to kind of take hold in you to get you there. And so well, what, um, and that's, yeah, I mean, what, what did that for you? as much as you feel like sharing, I mean, how did you start to, you started talking about it. How did you start turning the corner? What really got you there? Um, well, I had this experience when I was 25 and, and that was the first time I'd ever been able to, after that, to, uh, maintain like a long-term, not just physical, but emotional and spiritual sobriety. And then unfortunately I had that relapse, but by the time I went yeah. into the last rehab that I was in, I was done, you know, I just, I was, excuse me, I was done living life the way I'd been living life for so long. And just like, based on the kindness of strangers and like survival mode, like I just couldn't do it anymore. And I always, I, I always knew that like, that I was built a little bit differently and that I would be very capable of making change in the world I just like had to make the change in myself first so I did that and the last 10 years of my life have really been based around like a heart of service so like Mm -hmm. the more I think about you the less I think about me and anytime I'm called on to do anything to help anybody I just show up and do it and that's that's allowed me and afforded me a life beyond my wildest dreams and when I say that it doesn't mean that like I'm in all these movies again and I have a million dollars in the bank and I have all of this like cool shit that that 
literally has nothing to do with it. And I think that's why I get to live such a good life today is because it's for the first time, not about all of this other external shit that Mm -hmm. really doesn't fucking matter. But just the gratitude of like, I woke up in a bed this morning and I put my feet down on uh, the ground of my apartment and I was able to shower and drink coffee and like all of these things. And I consistently think of all the people that are living on the street that don't have those basic human needs met. And I think because I'm, for the most part, I'm able to tap into that. I've been able to live a very different life the last 10 years. And when my friends are in trouble, I step in and help. And when, you know, um, someone calls on me for anything, uh, I just show up and do it, you know, and I think that's why I've been able to turn it around. That's such a cool kind of a echo of your childhood though as an actor is like you know you spent that kind of escaping into other people being these other characters and now it's you do something very similar except it's real world you're focusing on other people you know, that's kind right. of what you just said it's it's a very totally. similar thought process just a different way of going about it and it, yeah it is really but cool. I mean I just want to be clear too and say that like that has all come because I have focused so much on myself and yeah. done all of the internal work to figure out why I was acting out and behaving the way yeah. that I behaved most of my life. Yeah, I was about to ask you what that, basically I was going to ask you like what that process was for you to kind of, because it is what it takes. It's how you got to kind of understand yourself before you can start to accept and heal and deal with some totally. of this stuff. So how did you go about yeah. that? Yeah, I mean, you can't love another human being fully until you like love yourself in that way first. And it was a lot of different processes for me. There was therapy, there was the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, there was um, understanding, you know, the the human ego and how to like bring that down a little bit, which is something I think we're, I'm always working on. And um, like I said, the, the understanding of the statement that like, the more I think about you, the less I think about me, not because I don't need to nurture and heal and think about myself, but think about myself in the way of like, how, how can I get something? How can like, all of that has to be removed in order to like really center and ground a human being into like who they were meant to be in this world. So there was a long, you know, process and it never ends and it's always ongoing. And I always have to be working on that kind of stuff. And I think it was just like each esteemable act that I was doing allowed me to have a little bit more self-esteem. And, and I got to a place finally in my life where I really loved myself, not because of like how I look or what I have or what I've done, but just like really love the person that Natanya is. And Mm -hmm. Um, and that gave me all the room in the world to like omit that to other people and help them become that like fully formed, actualized person as well. Yeah, no, it's like, that's how it, that's how it goes is you gotta, sometimes you gotta kind of lose everything to like realize just who you actually are. And in your case, I mean, you were, you grew up just so confused about who you actually were, what was going on in your life and all that. And so you had to get down to that, you know, just the core of you to actually even yeah. know who you were I mean and yeah. as it turns out in a very literal sense you then later find out you have a actual whole biological family so you were yeah. working yeah. through just a lot of stuff through all that yeah yeah I think that's one I mean that's something we talked about uh, before is I mean one of the things people who don't understand addiction don't understand that it's never sure it's the drug and the the disease of addiction but it its roots generally are not in let me go get fucked up (laughs) the roots are in how can I get the hell away from this shit that hurts more or less is that true to your experience that's exactly it yeah Yeah. I mean that's the difference between like recreational drinking and partying Mm -hmm. and like a need to feel anything other than what you're feeling like a, a, a an obsession to get anything outside of yourself in So you don't have to like deal with what's going on inside. Yeah. How long did it take you to understand that though? Uh, I think I'm still learning it. (laughs) (laughs) Right. I I think I'm still understanding it, but that's the disease of alcoholism and the, the why of, you know, a non-addict is like, but why, but why are you doing that? Why are you doing that? Like the understanding of all of that, I don't think really came till I was about 30 years old. Yeah. 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 
are you getting back into acting now or do you want to um, do you miss it or are you like okay with that being the best yeah no I definitely miss it um it's a huge part of who I am uh I think I'm like a born entertainer and I've found ways to entertain whether it's like what it I thought it was going to look like or not but yes I actually am now getting back into acting um I I am doing a movie right now all right um yeah and uh, um can you tell us anything about it uh there's not a lot to tell right now okay. um but more more will be revealed and it's you know the first thing I've done in a really long time and uh I I just I think that if that is the opportunity for me in the in this later part of my life then it will present itself and um you know I I just I've, I've had, I've, I've just been doing a lot in the entertainment kind of pocket of my life. A lot of podcasts, a lot of big podcasts, a lot of smaller podcasts, a lot of, um, you know, photo shoots, a lot of appearances. And now with this book going on. And so there's just a lot of stuff going on. So the movie just kind of felt organic and, um, you know, I'm, I'm not auditioning. It was just kind of offered to me. And I said, yes. So, I think as far as like the acting part of it, like I will always, I'm, I'm a big believer in saying yes to every opportunity that comes your way with, within reason. Mm -hmm. um, I think it just leads to more and more and more. The more action you put into something, the more reaction you get back from the universe. So yeah. that's just kind of where I'm at with it. I don't think, I don't think my story ends where my story ended with acting. I think there's something mm -hmm. else. And um, I'm very lucky to have a fan base that, has kind of stuck with me for like 25 years and um you know they're like a little army of people that are constantly like you got to do it you got to do it you got to do it but yeah. you know I think it's going to happen I just don't know what it's going to look like but I'm I'm open and I'm ready for the opportunity and I think that I will um experience it and cherish it in a different way now as an adult than I was ever able to as a teenager yeah um that's one thing I meant to ask about when we were in that part of your story was just how Robin Russo came about mm -hmm. and how, you know, much she was or wasn't like you. I mean, you mentioned a little bit, you know, she was giving you a lot of what she was also given, you know, a lot of other people who yeah. reached out and told you what she meant to them. Yeah. And then, and then how that kind of faded. Uh, I mean, that was part of the, the heroine story too, right? Was no, no. no. So that was a lot before. So Okay. Robin came about, I, I had auditioned multiple times for Alex Mack for all different characters for Alex for the sister and got pretty much very right down to the line. Multiple times, they shot the pilot, they ended up recasting it, they called me back to come in for both Alex and Annie, that obviously didn't work out. They called my agent said we love her we wrote a part just for her. All she has to do is come down and screen test. I go back down there again. There's 50 other girls there for it. I was like pretty much done with them and done with that um, production team. I was like, fuck these people. I'm not auditioning one more time for anything. Yeah. I'm going to get a no for again. I was already like a very much a working actor in Hollywood at that time. Uh, very already very recognizable. So I went down and, you know, I just kind of like did my thing. Um, and by the time I got home, they called and obviously offered me the role. It was mm. just supposed to be three episodes. Um, uh. I did three episodes at the end of the third episode, they called and offered me a series regular role on the show. I think my agent and my mom, everybody was pretty smart about the way we handled contracts because I, I, I knew I already had a vision for myself at that time. I knew that I was going to be doing a lot of different stuff. So I wanted to make yeah. sure contractually I could get out of certain episodes if I needed to, to go film a movie or a guest spot or commercial or what have you. Um, but that character just very organically turned into a pretty like iconic figure of Nickelodeon, 90s Nickelodeon. Yeah. And she was um, uh, kind of like me in certain ways. I think the sarcasm was on point like obviously I brought the sarcasm to life um so yeah. I think that in any like long-term character that an actor is playing it eventually some of it's going to bleed into like naturally how you present regardless yeah. um but also in a lot of ways we were incredibly different and I was obviously going through puberty on that show and some of her 
wardrobe made me sick to my stomach and the hairstyles and I was just like fuck this is not me no. um but in hindsight the fashion was so iconic and I would die for some of those outfits today and um so that's how she, that's how she came about and she um just organically really developed into this um kind of um flagship entity of Alex Mack and yeah. uh yeah she was so fucking cool and in hindsight like i really understand her more and more as an adult and and um yeah that's that's robin yeah. that's how robin yeah. oh yeah i mean that was a whole other piece of it too that we didn't really have time to get into but i remember talking a lot about before too was just you I mean growing up going through adolescence like in public yeah. essentially i mean that's Crazy. a whole other factor mm -hmm. in this i mean it's just you were carrying so much, Natanya. I mean, holy shit. Yeah. Um, and I was a redhead, you know, it was like <laughs> and I was a redhead. Hair, bright orange hair, On top very of it all. Skin. You know, um, I was not cute at all until I was like 14, 15 years old. That's finally when boys were like, Oh my god, you're so hot. But like up until then, it wasn't that. I was always like the best friend, the side character, what have you, and never like the beautiful girl and you know so all of that like plays a part into your psyche as well and yeah. then you know i i started alex mack when i was 11 and we ended when i was 17 and like the just the physical changes i go through from season to season are pretty incredible actually to go back and look at i started the show i was like i mean i look like an entirely different human being from when i yeah. ended so I understand why people feel so connected to me and so connected to that character too, because as they were growing up, I was growing up and, yeah. and they watched me transform physically and emotionally and all of that as they were doing the same thing, you know, but yeah, it's, it's uncomfortable and it's weird. And, um, but it's also like awesome too. I mean, it's, yeah. Uh, I was just thinking that I mean it's as hard as all the hard stuff was and probably still is sometimes because I mean this stuff has a way of following us forever we just learn how yeah. to deal with it but I mean the flip side is I mean you gave people you know that to the degree where now 20 years later they still care about it in like it's a real care. passionate way and like that in means you gave some, you gave people something really beautiful and comforting and Thank you. just meaningful and like you, you know on one hand it's a silly nickelodeon show but like that's what entertainment and art and like movies yeah. and all, all this stuff i mean that's that's the point of it is to give you something that did what it did for you give that to other people as you take them away from their shit for a minute and yeah, they right. hold on to that the rest of their lives too so yeah, i mean i'm incredibly grateful just, for it all yeah um well you're doing great now you know and that's that's really cool to see and you. you're helping a lot of people still what um what do you want people to know about you as we you know come up on time here any parting thoughts yeah. concerns advice what what do yeah. people need to take away from Natanya um I think well I mean I think the biggest thing especially based on the kind of world we live in today is that most of what you see on social media is like bullshit and not real <laughs> you know yeah. and that people struggle everybody has a struggle and we need to like understand, you know, I think there's so much pressure put on like clothes and cars and money and like views and likes and, and uh, content and all of that kind of stuff. And that that's like the dope shit in the world today. Like that's what's so fucking cool. And I think the best yeah. parting words I could ever leave with anybody is that like the thing I think that is the most fucking cool, the most dope, like you cannot get to a higher consciousness than this is to be kind mm -hmm. to everybody like yeah. that's what's fucking cool and and that has been lost severely um in this day and age and that's okay because there's certain yeah. people that can just continue to remind everybody of that and also like my life is not um perfect by any means i still struggle i've had many struggles in the last 10 years and um you know uh everybody is going through something and, and you just yeah. need to be kind no matter what. And I've not been a perfect person um, many times loaded or sober. That's the truth. Yeah. Um, but I continue to try and work on myself to never be a perfect person, but just to be the kind of person that can look in the mirror and really like love the person that's looking back. And if you're struggling, reach out to somebody, you know, okay. I say that all the time on my social media, you can reach out to me, 
you reach out to a loved one. If you don't have somebody that you trust, seek somebody out, um, find your resources in your area. Um, because, you know, we live in a dangerous world of, of, um, of drugs that we uh, haven't, we haven't seen anything like this, at least in my lifetime. This is the, an epidemic that's literally killing people left and right. And sometimes uh, picking up the phone, even when it feels like a thousand pounds uh, will save your life. And, and that, you know, I think the, the thought that like, even if you watch somebody on television growing up and they were like your comfort every Saturday yeah. night or your comfort going to the movie theaters or what have you, like uh, a lot of us, you know, none of that shit matters. Like literally none of that matters. We've all been through something and, um, and it, and it will be okay. Eventually yeah. it will be okay. Yeah. Good deal. Thank you for that. Thank you for this. Thank you for your time. Yes, of course. Uh, I think this has been great. I'm going to cut off our recording here, but thanks okay. again. Of course. I really appreciate you. My pleasure. Thanks again, Natanya, for taking the time and thank all of you for listening. Again, subscribe to the newsletter at my website, brandonsneed.com, for more show notes and other cool stuff. And come back next week for another great episode. Thanks again for being here and have a good one.